اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ثم افیضو من حیث افاض الناس واستغفر اللہ ان اللہ غفور الرحیم فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Allah Ta'ala says in verse 199 in Surah Baqarah, ثُمَّ أَفِيضُوا مِنْ حَيْثُ أَفَاضُوا النَّاسِ Then flow down from where the people flowed. وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ And seek forgiveness from Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. So these are continuing the verses in regards to Hajj, the rulings and some guidance and instructions, what to do on Hajj. So this particular verse was revealed because of an incident which took place or because of a custom which the pagans had at that time. So the Quraysh, they had this special kind of say, status that they were the custodians of the Kaaba, very unique position of influence and it made them different to other people and they were very proud about this. So during the days of Jahiliya, uh, uh, whilst doing Hajj, when everyone was going towards Arafah, the Quraysh, in order to demonstrate their importance and how they were special, they would stop at Muzdalifa and they wouldn't follow the rest. They would stay at Muzdalifa. And they said that because we're the custodians, we're the caretakers of the Kaaba, of the Haram, it's, it's not proper for us to go out the limits of the Haram because Muzdalifa is located within the limits of the Haram, but Arafah is uh, on, on the outskirts. So they would use this as an excuse. We're the caretakers, we're the custodians of the haram, we need to stay in the limits. We're not going to follow the rest of you, you can carry on and go to Arafah. And from there, they came back. But the truth is that they just had pride and they just wanted to show off their pride and their arrogance that we're different, we're special, we're making our own group here. And they made it a point to the common people, the normal people, uh, that we're different to you and they tried to keep at a distance from them. So this, Allah Ta'ala apprehended this. Allah commanded them that no, ثُمَّ أَفِيضُوا مِنْ حَيْثُ أَفَاضُوا النَّاسِ That you need to go where everybody else is, is going. Where? The plain of Arafah. And then return from there with everybody else. Don't try to do something different and thinking you're special and you can't go with the common people. So we learn from this. And this is a general rule that if someone tries to behave like in, in a special way and they stay disconnected from others, because of arrogance, like this is a sin and this is um, a trait that Allah Ta'ala was criticizing here. We should never think that, you know, we're better, we're more royal, or we have a higher status, so we're not going to mix with everybody or we're not gonna, going to get involved in what the general people are doing. And this is what happened. And even worse on the day of uh, when doing Hajj is even worse. Why? Because the whole concept of Hajj is about unity. Everybody's wearing the same ihram, the same two pieces of cloth, like rich and poor, it doesn't matter anymore. No matter what status you have, whether you're learned, whether you're ignorant, and whether you're big, small, old, young, everybody is the same. That doesn't exist when you're in ihram, and especially in the days of Hajj. So on those days, if you're trying to display some kind of difference or some kind of authority over the rest of the people, then this further increases the degree of the crime, which is why Allah is calling them out. It's such a simple statement. Make sure go and flow where the rest of the people are flowing. But there was a story behind it, why it happened. So we learn human equality here. This statement, very small statement of the Quran teaches us this principle about social living, that the people who, because Allah has given people a higher status, but how should they live? Should, should they not mix with everybody? As Muslims, we should never cut off our relationship with anybody, no matter who they are, no matter how bad they are, no matter what job they are, no matter who they're working for, we have to mix with everybody. That's what being a Muslim is all about. And this creates Brotherhood, mutual brotherhood, this creates love, this creates unity, this removes the walls between the rich and the poor. Even the employer and the employee, 
if they're both Muslims, they should be treating, trying their best to treat each other with respect and with unity. Not that I'm the employer, I'm the boss, that you can't speak to me in such a way, I'm not going to go where you're going, we're two different groups of people. No, even they should try to mix and try to be on the same level. And this, during the last sermon of Hajj, the final farewell um, khutbah sermon that the Prophet ﷺ gave, he said something like a famous powerful statement that everybody quotes when he mentioned that no Arab is superior to a non-Arab, vice versa, no white person is superior to a black person and openly said this and this is a big thing because before this it was about rich and poor, it was about black and white and race and Arabs but he eradicated any kind of of um, uh, any kind of racism uh, or anything like this. So, and then what was the end of this? That superiority, if you want to have a higher status than other people, what does it depend on? On a person's taqwa, how close a person is with Allah. But that's a personal thing that we can't judge anybody's taqwa. We don't know what level they're on. So even it's wrong for a person to think, I'm a muttaqi, so now I'm better than a person. No, it's just Allah telling us that Allah does it, it doesn't, Allah, like the hadith, لا ينظروا إلى أجسامكم ولا إلى صوركم. Allah doesn't look at your bodies. Allah doesn't look at your appearances. In another version, وأموالكم. Allah doesn't look at your wealth. He just looks at your deeds and what's in your heart. Therefore, Allah Ta'ala is uh, the reason why this verse came down that those that wanted to establish like a special status for themselves uh, and stay at Muzdalifah, contrary to the rest of the people, Allah is telling them, don't do this. It's a sin that you, you, number one, don't do this again, but you need to seek forgiveness for what you have done. It's a big crime. That's why he's Allah saying, وَاسْتَغْفِرُ You need to repent for what you have done of cutting yourself off from other people. It's a big sin. But in Allah Ghafur Rahim, Allah is the most forgiving. So وَاسْتَغْفِرُ Ask Allah for his forgiveness. In Allah Ghafur Rahim. Allah Ta'ala, most forgiving, the most merciful. In regards to istighfar, Great length, could, uh, so much can be said about istighfar, how necessary it is on a daily basis for us to do various istighfar, the, 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 the act of tawbah, repentance. But I'll just share one, because I feel this is the most powerful istighfar, and the reward we get from this is very unique. So Shaddad bin Aus narrates that the Prophet wasallam said, Sayyidul istighfar ayyakul al abd, that the, the master of supplication for forgiveness. The Sayyidul Istighfar, this is the, the leader, the master of all Istighfar, is, and, and this is the dua, Allahumma anta Rabbi, la ilaha illa anta, oh Allah, you are my Lord. There is no deity worthy of worship except you. Khalaqtani wa ana abduk. You have created me and I am your servant. Wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'dika mastata'ad. I am on your covenant as much as I can be. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sanat. And awaiting, uh, I seek refuge with you from the evil that I have committed. I admit your favor on me. And I admit my faults. So please forgive me. Nobody can forgive. Uh, so forgive me for none except you can forgive sins. A beautiful dua, a powerful dua, very comprehensive dua. But on top of this, not only is it Sayyid al-Istighfar, but there's a special reward for it. The narration continues. Man qalaha fi laylatin, famata fi laylati, dakhala al jannah. Whoever read this dua at night and he happened to die the same night, he will enter paradise. Wa man qalaha fi yawmi, famata dakhala al jannah. But whoever said it during the day and he died during that day, he will enter paradise. So we should already have our set and our routine or a set of Adhkar, which we do every morning and every evening, if this isn't part of it, make it a part of it. And if we don't have any Adhkar that we read yet, then at least start with this. It only takes a few seconds. In the morning, Allahumma anta rabbi, la ilaha illa ta khalaqtani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahtika wa adika masata'at, a'udhu bika min sharri ma sana'at, abu'u laka bin i'matika alayhi wa abu'u bi dhanbi faghfirli, innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta. About 15 seconds it takes, 10 seconds. And then, if we read this every day, we will die one day, and then the day we die, we guaranteed we know that we will be heading to Jannah. That's all we need to do. Read this once in the morning or once in the evening. Morning meaning it could be from Fajr time all the way until, you know, before the noon, at least before 
before the start time of Dhuhr, you can say, but it's best to do it around Fajr time or when we wake up early in the morning. And the evening means, uh, some say from Asr onwards, some say from Maghrib onwards, all the way until we go to sleep. And that could be later night. So we have like, ample time to read. Learn this Dhuhr. But he doesn't say the one who memorized this dua, we can read it from a book, we can read it from a paper. So set this target for ourselves, we will not miss this dua. The next verse, Allah Ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ When you have fulfilled your sacred rights, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوَشَدَ ذِكْرًا Praise Allah as you used to praise your forefathers, meaning before Islam, or even more, أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا Even more passionately, praise Allah. So there's a reason why this happened, there was another custom, um, Ibn Abbas and said that during the time of Jahiliyyah, people used to stand during the Hajj and one of them used to stand up and say, oh, my father used to feed the poor, he used to help others in their disputes or give people money. My father used to pay the diyya, the blood money and so forth. And then the, this was their only dhikr, their only dhikr they had that they would remember their fathers and boast about them and take pride in what their forefathers used to do. So this is another jahili custom, which Allah Ta'ala is trying to get rid of here. The Arabs of Jahiliya, once they finished their rites of Arafah and Muzdalifah, and they performed their tawaf and they did their sacrifice um, and, and stay in, uh, in Mina, because you have to stay for a good portion of time in Mina, they used to hold gatherings, they used to sit together in groups, um, but these gatherings were different. There, there was no dhikr, there was no tilawa. They were just boasting about their forefathers and their lineage and their ancestors. Uh, so they were told, Allah Ta'ala is telling you, that as soon as you finish your ihram rites, when you stay at Mina, Mina is not just for eating and sleeping and enjoying and talking. It's for dhikrullah. It's for remembrance of Allah Ta'ala. And leave out this practice of indulging in just useless talk and boasting about your uh, stories uh, of the past, um, especially boasting about achievements that you have to do. And our ashadda dhikra, like not, don't just remember Allah like you used to remember your forefathers, our ash, even more you should be doing the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. So the Quran, yes, it's a guidance of uh, Allah Ta'ala talking to those people, but it's for us as well. These customs, from ignorance, from jahiliyyah, especially in the days of hajj. Hajj is exclusively reserved for ibadah. Like the, 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 the whole week or those whole few days, that's it, ibadah, dhikr. And if you do it in the days of hajj, it has its own separate, unique reward. So why waste that and, and do other things instead? It's because this is a gift from Allah. Anybody that gets an opportunity to go for hajj, massive gift. A person goes to hajj, a person might only get to do Hajj once in their entire lifetime. And those who have been, it's a difficult journey and it costs a lot of money financially and it going with family, going with a group. And we've spoke about before how Allah wants us to be patient, going through the difficult time, but it is difficult. And for many, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Now, if Allah has allowed someone to go through Hajj, accomplish all the rituals one by one, and then at the end of that, towards the end of that, where we're meant to be grateful to Allah and remembering Allah, like we just end it by like wasteful talk and chit chat and, and just chilling out and, and discussing other things. Then this is not a way of being grateful to Allah Ta'ala. Even though Allah Ta'ala mentions like, uh, 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 like uh, dhikri aba'ikum. But that was the way they used to pass time in their days. So when they would get together, they would just talk about that. That was the thing they, they would waste time uh, and, 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 and discuss. But nowadays, it's whatever people discuss. So if people are sitting down, and, and it happens, like I remember when I went for Hajj, anybody can say the same. It happens in Mina, because Mina, some people, they, there's nothing to do. Literally, you just sat there all day, uh, in, in, in a tent, there's tea, there's coffee, there's food, but there's, there's not much to do. And literally people think it's for resting and for socializing because you're not walking around, you're not doing hajj, you're not doing tawaf, you're not, you're not pelting anything, you're just sat there. So that's when it happens. Uh, people wasting time talking, unnecessary talks, like socializing, gathering, laughing, joking. And it, it, it literally, a lot, a lot of the time goes to waste there. So this Allah is reminding us, 
that don't you waste time in useless talks, especially when you're in Mina, especially in the days of Hajj, because uh, this is not what we should be doing. This is a warning for them. It's a warning for us as well. But we also learn from this. If there's a certain environment or the, a certain ibadah or, or program or wherever we are that's meant for the worship of Allah, Allah doesn't like where we mix in laughing, joking, socializing. Those things shouldn't be a part. They're two separate things. Like a person might have come to the masjid and they're, they're having like a 24-hour spiritual retreat or there's a, like a full-day program or, or whatever it is. It, they shouldn't be mixed in there just talking and, and about worldly things, useless things. That shouldn't be uh, mixed in there. Allah Ta'ala is warning us for doing something like this. And, uh, and actually what we should be replacing this with, dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. The next verse, Sa'id bin Jubayr says that Ibn Abbas anhu said, some Bedouins, they used to come to the standing area on Arafah, and they used to make dua. We know Arafah is a place where the person should make dua. They used to say that, Oh Allah, make this year a rainy year, a fertile year, a year of good childbearing. And they wouldn't mention anything about the Akhirah. They just mention a few things about the world. So, فَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ There are some who say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا Oh Allah, oh Allah, grant us things if of the dunya. Grant us bounties in the world. وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ but they will have no share in the hereafter. Meaning, people who make dua, that kind of dua, where they only ask for dunya, they don't care about the akhirah, they're not asking for it. So Allah is saying, no problem, I'll give you the dunya, you won't have anything in the akhirah. But an interesting thing here, on the one hand, we learn from a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, so Allah is teaching us that we should ask for anything, ask Allah for anything, even if it be a shoelace, ask Allah. But here we're learning in this verse that those people who are just asking for the dunya, they won't have anything of the akhirah. But what it means, it means priority. We should ask Allah in priority. For like one of the first things we learned, we're meant to make dua for ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. That's the first part of the Quran. We read this in the salah every day. Oh Allah, get, grant us guidance, allow us to guide us to the path towards uh, the, the, the right path to guidance. And then... This you can say is the first complete dua in the Quran when we open the Quran. So we can, everything we use in this dunya, it's actually we're meant to use it for the akhirah. Like we eat food, it's to give us energy to worship. We earn money so we can provide for my family, help good causes. All these things that they're there, but to use for the akhirah. But some people, they have, the, they have their Muslim, they have Islam, and when we have Islam, we are in a, a position to ask for guidance, ask for Jannah, ask for the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala, but they just, for some reason, they think, well, I've, I've got Islam, I've got Iman, like, I, I've got that, now I need to focus on all the du'as for the dunya. And if we do this and we prefer, give preference to when we make du'a, give preference to dunya, most of the things we ask is for dunya. This is actually an insult to deen. We're meant to be asking more. For, we can ask for both, but priority should always be given to deen. And there are, a lot, there, there are a lot of people who have a very materialistic attitude. They just live lives of dunya. Like meaning, they'll do Ramadan, they'll do Hajj, they'll do fasting, but their du'as are different. When they make du'as, they literally, they're not asking for the forgiveness of Allah, their Islam for their children, for the forgiveness of their parents. They're asking, oh Allah, like the economy is going bad, like give me a good job, make sure my house is paid off, you know, make sure I get the promotion. And it's okay, but then they don't add anything else about akhirah. It's just dunya. Allah is criticizing those kind of du'as. This is what the people in Jahiliyyah used to do. Only ask for dunya, not ask for akhirah. Allah is telling them there'll be nothing for you in the akhirah. So we have to be really careful how we make du'a. Allah taught us, ask Allah for anything, the smallest of things, worldly things, but don't leave out asking for the akhirah as well. Our biggest concern should be the akhirah. And if we ask for dunya, it should be with the intention that I need this to help me on my path to the Akhirah. So then the believers that used to come after them, they used to say, 
وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا Oh, our Lord grants us the good of this world. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا The good of the hereafter. وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And protect us from the torment of the fire. So Allah is praising the people who used to recite this specific dua. Those who go for Umrah or Hajj, this is the masnoon dua to say when you're doing tawaf from Rukni Yamani to Hajr Aswad, you, and we'll, you normally you hear everybody in big groups, everybody is reading this du'a. It's not the only du'a we should be reading. This, we should be reading many different du'as, but especially this is the masnoon du'a. It's a very powerful du'a. And this supplication mentioned in this verse, it's very, the most comprehensive du'a that, that there ever is. We're asking Allah for all the good things. When we say, Rabbana atina fi dunya, yes, we're asking for the dunya, but hasana, it changes it and it makes it different. Um, so, for example, all the good things like scholars mention when we're saying, grant me good in the world, we're asking for good well-being, like a spacious home, a happy family, sufficient provision, beneficial knowledge, a good job, good deeds, comfortable means of transportation, good praise, respect, all of these things we're asking for in dunya. And these are good things that we should ask for. Uh, and another way of understanding this that um, one commentator said that hasana, so we're asking Allah, Oh Allah, give us the most beautiful things in the dunya. And we look in one hadith, it mentioned, لقد, sorry, in, in, uh, we look in one verse talking about the Prophet لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة That in the, in the life, in the, in the lifestyle, in the way of the Prophet وسلم, is the hasana, is the perfect example, the perfect way of life, a beautiful way of life. So the Prophet وسلم, is he a role model? It's talking about role model this verse. Is he a role model in the akhirah? Or is he a role model in the dunya? He's a role model in the dunya. So it's as if, uh, so Allah is saying the best thing you can have in this world is the, the living the life that the Prophet ﷺ lived. So when we're saying, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, where it's as if we're asking Allah, allow us to be followers of the best role model in the best way. The best thing you can have in this world is being able to follow the man who lived the best possible life. It's an interesting way of looking at this verse. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Oh Allah, give me the, the good of the akhirah. The hereafter, and these obviously we're asking Allah for Jannah. Uh, but if we're asking Allah for Jannah, then automatically we're asking Allah to to uh, well, give me refuge, safety from Jahannam. Uh, so it refers to um, oh Allah, us keep me away from Jahannam, but also allow me to be questioned lightly on the day of judgment and give me all the favors. In, on the Day of Judgment and in Jannah as well. وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Oh Allah, save me from the fire, including anything that leads to the fire, any sin, any temptation, any bad habit. Oh Allah, save me from this. وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ Save me from the fire, but save me from anything in the world that would lead me to the fire. All kind of sins and all kind of doubts. Al-Qasim bin Abdul Rahman said, Whoever is gifted, with a grateful heart, a remembering tongue, a tongue that remembers Allah and a patient body will have been endowed with a good deed in this life, a good deed in the hereafter and saved from the torment of the fire. This is why the Sunnah encourages us to read this dua. The most common dua we read anyway, but try to understand. You know, like if we have more expectations from Allah when reading the same du'as we've been reading, Allah will treat us according to our expectations. If we just say, Rabbana, if we know that, okay, I'm probably, I'm asking for dunya, I'm asking for akhirah, that's about it. But if we visualize and we have a mindset that I'm asking for all these things in the dunya, Allah will give us more. All these things I'm asking for, Allah will give us more. And Allah will safeguard us from all these kind of sins uh, and temptations. So we need to say this dua while pondering upon what we're saying and definitely bring into practice Sayyid al-Istighfar. Make a habit of reading it every morning uh, and every evening and especially if Allah, Allah accept and allow all of us to go for Umrah and to go for Hajj again and again and when we get that opportunity don't fall into the customs of Jahiliyyah where we try to cut ourselves off from the common people. And that's not just for Hajj, that's for now. Like mixed with everybody. Social, I don't think anybody is a lower status than me. So I don't care about him. I won't mix with him. Mix with everybody. But at the same time, we shouldn't be mixing any kind of uh, Islamic rituals, any kind of, uh, any kind of ibadah 
with socializing and boasting and taking pride of my forefathers and my family. And remember, that was the way they used to uh, waste their time and discuss what, what the, the way that it happens today. People might be talking about social media, about movies, about showbiz, about whatever it is. Like Allah doesn't like those discussions at those times where we should be remembering Allah. Everything has its own place. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the correct understanding and the ability to bring all these advices into our life. Ameen wa akhra da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'na wa iyaakum bil ayati wa tikil hakeem. Ameen.